Few wrestlers have a character arc as heinous as Triple H. Who he was in the beginning compared to who he became in the end are two very different people, but we want to focus on the in-between. We'll look at why the Blue Blood became the Cerebral Assassin, how the last man standing from the click played the game, beat it, and then ruled it. But to do all this, he had to become the sickest SOB the industry had ever seen. For this video, we will look at Triple H's most evil traits and despicable acts. We'll discuss how he masterminded his way to the top and then stayed there. We'll cover the lengths he had to go to, the people he betrayed, then screwed over along the way and what it all meant in the end. Today we highlight what made Triple H wrestling's greatest heel. First let's briefly look at the foundations of Triple H's heel persona. His initial run as Hunter Hearst Helmsley offered little in the way of storyline or character substance but what it did do was hone his craft as a student of the game by getting to wrestle everyone on the roster. Meanwhile a strong work ethic and great attitude behind the scenes allowed Hunter to make bonds and form friendships. That eventually began to play out on television with the arrival of D-Generation X. And with that, Helmsy was off to the races. But not before a peek behind the curtain nearly ended it all. Yes, Hunter was the only one punished for the events of the kayfabe breaking curtain call, which saw real life friends that were heels and faces on TV share a moment together. But it was how then mid carder Helmsy responded to being positioned down the card that set him up for greatness. Here, the true foundations of Triple H took shape in the form of legit frustrations for taking the heat for something he only played a bit part role in. Madison Square Garden, I walked to the ring to say goodbye to my friend. Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Shawn Michaels. Who got punished for that, JR? Me. This was coupled with a passion that saw him eat, sleep, and breathe the business. In this game, Hunter Hearst Helmsley's mission could not fail. Leading factions has been synonymous with Triple H's career. He was ready to step into Shawn Michaels' shoes as the leader of D-Generation X in 1998. Eventually, Hunter leaned less on the comedy that made the group popular. He was becoming more vicious and cutthroat, and so to further set himself apart as a ruthless villain, he had to cut ties with DX. And while Helmsy played mostly a support role in the corporation, it was only so we could move further up the ladder. Then shortly after capturing the WWF Championship, China was gone. It didn't matter how much she had done for Triple H, her presence would have thwarted Helmsy's next move. If it wasn't for me, you'd be nothing. You got that? I made you. You know well. I can break you! For China. Come on out here and get your ass kicked, you big jacked up bitch! The game had done so much to be anti-established, he now had his eyes set on becoming the establishment. This meant marrying the boss's daughter. Once Helmsy reached the top, he was ready to let DX back in to help him stay there. The dynamic was like they needed him more than he needed them. Even though DX played a crucial role in helping Triple H keep his title and fight off the baby faces, this was how the game manipulated and pulled the strings. Just like before, once the likes of X Park and Billy Gunn weren't enough use to him anymore, they were gone. What? Relax, relax, listen to me for a second. Billy, what the deal is? <laughs> hey! What the hell? A similar situation played out with Evolution, but in a different way. While the members of DX were essentially expendable cogs in the wheel, Evolution was to be a faction that preserved the future of the business, but only at Triple H's leisure. In storyline, the group was a vehicle to keep the game on top of Raw as world champion, but at the same time, it would revitalize an old legend and create two upcoming stars. So if you wake up one day and you're lying in a hospital bed and you're all beat up and you're wondering to yourself, what in the hell happened? Evolution has just passed you by. Randy Orton and Batista were allowed to prosper at Triple H's pace. The minute they got too big for their boots, they were choice with playing second fiddle to Hunter or evolving on their own. The latter of which meant turning on the man who helped them get to the dance. It was all calculated. Even Ric Flair, who never left Hunter's side, was put to the sword after finding individual success while Helmsy was away. Triple H could not stand to see someone overshadow him. Even when his days on the active roster were behind him, while a part of the authority, Triple H was still the star of the show. Sure, Randy Orton and Seth Rollins were the world champions. However, it was Hunter and Stephanie opening every show, feuding with the top babyfaces Daniel Bryan, Sting, and Roman Reigns. Oh my God! Oh my God! No! What the hell? What the hell? 
This ultimately led to marquee WrestleMania matches. And just like in previous factions, when a stable member became defiant or unruly, they were done for. After Evolution split for a second time, Triple H facilitated the destruction of the Shield, so Seth Rollins could be the WWE's top guy. There's always a plan B. Oh my god! But when Rollins got injured after being rocket strapped by Stefan Triple H, he was deemed as fragile. In Seth's absence, the authority collapsed. The game was the last person standing and had to challenge for the WWE title himself. He would never put all his trust in just one man to carry the company again. Marrying into the McMahon family practically ensured Triple H had lifetime heat from certain fans. Firstly, because of how it played out on television as an angle, and then because of how it actually happened in real life and was put into storyline again. When it came to the story, Stephanie was eager to get revenge after what her brother and father had put her through. Where to, Stephanie? <laughs> But Triple H still had the charm, manipulate, conspire, and coerce a scheme to make everything happen. Basically, he had to win over Stephanie privately, convince her to dump her fiance, then facilitate a great big elaborate ruse. Have to watch this. All to ensure the game got a shot and won the WWF title, and then ultimately forced the other McMahons out. Then once it all came together and Hunter and Stephanie were running the show, the only way Vince and Shane could get their power back was if they joined forces with the McMahon Helmsy regime. This is humiliation, the indignity of this. The Rock will never forget this night. This showed just how plotting and conniving Triple H's character was. He outplanned, outsmarted, and defeated the most evil family in wrestling by destroying them from within. You either get your ass kicked or you get your ass fired. Helmsy forced them to accept him as the top wrestler in the industry. Marrying the boss to get ahead in business? Who thinks up that kind of stuff? Helmsy once said in a private saying all the way back in the late 90s that one day he wanted to run the company. This would soon become a true reality. He became a greater presence behind the scenes as time went on, earning an executive role. When this played out on screen as the authority, it got Hunter some of the most heat of his career. They're saying it's your turn. Not just because of how he was screwing popular stars, but also because of how he incorporated previous life issues. With top babyface Daniel Bryan being compared to the likes of Chris Jericho, Edge, and Rob Van Dam, All of whom weren't deemed best for business or considered enough of a draw to be a top guy. And three men who each, at one point, had heat with Triple H behind the scenes. Guys like Jericho, Edge, Rob Van Dam. If any of those guys had been the face of the WWE, We'd all be working for Ted Turner right now. I hate to be the one to break it to you, but you never do a dime, buddy. The game leaned heavily on the idea that he held down, buried, and politically sabotaged wrestlers during his reign on top. At WrestleMania, I put an end to your dreams, and I bury Daniel Bryan. All of this greatly enhanced the authority versus Daniel Bryan feud in 2013 and 2014. By 2024, Triple H was the sole McMahon family presence in WWE, both on TV and behind the scenes. He was the last McMahon standing, and the only one left with any power. Triple H greatly benefited from being in groups and marrying into the McMahon family, destroying lives in the process. But when it all came down to it, the in-ring and physicality was going to be where the cerebral assassin did the most damage. The game stopped at nothing to win. To be the best, defeating opponents wasn't enough for him. Helms he made it a point to completely main his rivals. He's as deadly as they come, the cerebral assassin. We're tied at three. Oh my God! For the love of God, the man stole this crap. Oh, oh my no, God! No. Using his bare hands and all kinds of weapons such as the trusted Sledgehammer. The Sledgehammer showed just how sadistic Hunter was. The fact that he would use such a life-threatening object to destroy his opponents spoke volumes about the type of character he was. Kane is not helpless! Oh, no! Triple H 
just got that sledgehammer. Go! That is the Clicks trademark sign. Oh! And twice! <laughs> enough is enough. Let's have the battle! Hell in a Cell was where the game learned what it took to end another man's career, as Cactus Jack and referee Tim White saw their careers end at the hands of the cerebral assassin inside the cell. Oh, they're gonna... Oh my god! The cage broke! The ring broke! And Cactus Jack has broken the hip Oh no! Oh, 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 oh my god! What's doing now? Oh, god. oh god! This type of match was the perfect place for Hunter to wreak havoc. A steel chair, and you can see it looks like barbed wire around it. No, 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 no! Oh my God. After being handed the World Heavyweight Championship on Raw in September 2002, Triple H began what many fans referred to as his reign of terror. This was where Hunter held the title for the best part of 16 months all in all. While holding the big gold belt, the game defeated and usually destroyed everyone in his path, including a who's who of former WCW wrestlers. Completely out of it. Somebody like you doesn't get to be a world champion. You think this is over between us, Goldberg? Well, it's not. It's not over. Look at this! That's a his title reign seemed never-ending. He won more matches cleanly compared to your typical heel. If Hunter said something on television, it usually came to fruition at the pay-per-view. All of this earned him a lot of heat from fans. Triple H borrowed heavily from Ric Flair during his reign of terror. Hunter, who idolized Flair, wanted to be the working heel that could get a good long match out of everyone, just like Nate back in his day. The old Attitude Era brawling matches were gone in favor of a more methodical main event style. The game began dressing in suits and also wore different colored trunks for the first time in his career. And to top it off, he had his own four horsemen like faction in evolution as if people didn't have enough reasons to dislike triple h already he was now flaunting a lifestyle fans could only dream of helmsy also got married to stephanie mcmahon in real life around this time everything was coming together for the cerebral assassin with the rock and stone cold out of the picture triple h was finally able to be the guy but did so as a despised heel one of the ways the game cemented himself as a reprehensible heel were through his promos it wasn't just the content of what he said but also the intense drawn out delivery as well as the remorse behind his words and actions. But Austin, you might be a student of the game. I am the game! Mick Foley, your blood will stain New York City. Rock, you will know once and for all, I am that damn good! I have no remorse. I have no conscience. And I will stop at nothing. He who laughs last laughs best and today i'm laughing face facts you can't wrestle anymore you're done it's over i grabbed the wagon and yeah i started to drag it but i've been dragging it all along just finally you weren't around to stand in my way the game has passed you by now i am the showstopper i will put the animal down in real life you can't beat the bad guy you are no longer the dirtiest player in the game the game is over what makes you the best is coming to this ring and defending a title night after night month after month year after year if you're a millionaire you're evil if you're a billionaire you're the antichrist i would rather eat well than sleep well hunter knew how much his words carried weight when it came to getting heat which is why he liked to push the crowd's buttons by burying them both generally and individually i don't come to where this guy works and tell him when the fries are done oh. much where this fat piece of crap is sitting right here <laughs> I don't come to where this chick works and tell her what street corner to stand on. Oh. When they don't get what they want, they cry about it. When they don't, they don't you know. And, and if that doesn't work, 
Me and my friend Mark, we're gonna stop watching. Triple H's evil promos built a classic rivalries against the likes of The Rock, Stone Cold, Mick Foley, Kurt Angle, and Shawn Michaels. As a heel, Hunter was the perfect foil for the company's top baby faces. Before his work on the microphone and in the ring, he always knew how to get the audience to dislike him. While keeping the shine on the wrestler he was working with, the feud with The Rock saw real-life competitive rivalry play out on television. Both were on the ascent at the same time and eager to prove themselves as main event players. Their matches brought out the best in each other. Their feud was one of the WWF's best. It lasted on and off for the best part of a year and was supposed to be revisited at WrestleMania 34 but never came to be. As we were coming up, it would be like we were on different sides all the time but constantly striving to get to that next level. Helmsley's obsession with being the best drove him to commit devastating acts. If he was able to stay on top, then he had to be better than Steve Austin. The game went to insane lengths to try and take Austin out of the picture. It gave new meaning to the cerebral assassin moniker. Helmsley wearing, a, wearing Austin out the steel tip. Helmsley's trying to, to rip Austin under. Oh my God! Oh my God! Too late! Just hit Austin! Now you know, you dumb son of a bitch. The feud that made Triple H, however, came against Mick Foley. The two had a memorable program in 1997, as each were eager to prove themselves. Driver, yes! Their program in 2000 ascended the game to superstardom. As sick and violent as Cactus Jack was, Helmsley had to match him if he was to win. This feud gave Hunter a sadistic and brutal edge that encapsulated the rest of his career. You are fired! Get out! Get out! Helmsley's jealousy of Stephanie's admiration for Kurt Angle formed the basis of a love triangle between the three. Steph's crush on Angle started off subtle. Each time she brought him up, the game got more and more agitated until things finally reached its boiling point during the summer of 2000. He is a pretty great wrestler. But kill him. Alternative lifestyles are perfectly acceptable in this day and age. Wait a minute. It made for great television, but never got a satisfying conclusion. Hunter didn't want to be the babyface during this rivalry, so the feud ended prematurely. A shame given how well it had been built up for over a year. The feud with Shawn Michaels was an easy story to tell, given their history. Hunter finally got the spotlight after Michaels retired. Then when HBK returned in 2002, the game wanted Shawn as his manager. Helmsy saw Michaels' refusal as a threat, and from there, all the pent-up aggression and jealousy from both parties unraveled, such as Triple H's resentment from playing second fiddle to Shawn in DX, then being the only one left to deal with him after Michaels' life went off the rails, which led to a real-life falling out. Not to mention HBK's being jealous of the game reaching the top while Shawn couldn't wrestle. It wasn't just the wrestlers that Triple H had long-standing feuds with. Jim Ross provided the soundtrack to every one of Helmsy's dastardly acts. JR gave Hunter the Cerebral Assassin nickname and greatly put over the game as a heel on commentary. You son of a bitch, don't What's you hit her? her? Don't you hit her? Triple H, where did he come from? That son of a bitch! Does he have no conscience? Does he have no heart? Do you have no soul? You son of a bitch! Do you realize what you've just done? Damn you all the hell, Triple H! You son of a bitch! Why, Triple H? You son of a bitch! Why? Tell me why! I... Am reality. He's a son of a bitch if you ask me. Hey, hey, hey. Jim had plenty of personal ammunition given how much he was beaten up by Helmsy on TV. Jim, what are you doing? You idiot! What are you doing? 
I think you're a sorry, low down S O B. He was a damn good wrestler who didn't become that damn good of a character until adversity struck, turning punishment into opportunity. He's someone who eats, sleeps, and breathes the business, willing to do whatever it takes to be the best. This meant making a career out of being a wrestler fans love to hate. It's why he's the game, and it's what made Triple H wrestling's greatest heel. Now, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out our similar video, where we debate what made Vince McMahon wrestling's most evil villain. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.